Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to qualify that. They're sort of dogs. We're not quite sure. They're from <laughs> shelters. Okay, it's lovely to be here. Thank you very much for the invite. Becoming the world's most innovative bank. I was driving here and I'd been asked a couple of days ago to send through something that not many people know about me. Um, and I, I sent through the Abrumo and Beer comment. But I should have actually told you that um, my deepest secret is that my mom thinks I'm the head of innovation at FNB. And this is not the case. But I, I've tried to convince her that I'm not, but she won't hear me. She's never been more proud of me in her whole life. So um, my dad and I have just decided to let her be. Part of my job at FNB is I essentially run a competition. Not too dissimilar to the Argus or the Comrades Marathon, um, in that we have thousands of people entering every year. We know that not all of them are going to win a gold medal or a huge amounts of prize money, but they're still there and they're participating. And um, I think a more interesting question for me is why are they there? Why are they, why are they innovating and why are they com uh, competing in the competition? Um, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit as one of the key ingredients of how to build an innovative business. But I thought that I'd start with a video. Okay, so what I'm here to talk to you today about is um, some ingredients that have gone into this uh, recipe of creating an innovative organization. I'm really pleased to say that um, although there's general agreement in the organization around what ingredients go into the pot, no one's really sure of how much of each need to be applied. So if you were looking for the Coke recipe or the KFC 11 herbs and spices, I guess we can highlight what goes in, but um, what we've done in the innovation space is we've said, look, this thing isn't broken, let's not try and fix it. So we're playing a bit of a hide-and-seek game with this um, very playful child called innovation in our business. Um, and we've decided just to keep the game going. We haven't sort of ambushed the child, slam-dunked it onto a surgical table under surgical lights, dissected it, and tried to understand it very, very deeply. Um, 
But having said that, we are still aware of what the drivers of innovation at FNB are. So let's go through those. I thought the first thing uh, I'd like to talk to you about is managing expectations. So this is an advert that appeared in the Times in London in 1913, on the 9th of December, and said, um, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. It was posted by a guy called Ernest Shackleton, um, and people were encouraged to come to 4 Burlington Street if they were interested in applying. He was looking for 53 people to participate in an expedition to one of the poles. 5,000 people arrived the next day at the address. It's a fascinating story in leadership, primarily because the mission failed, but he managed to bring all 53 back successfully. And if you haven't checked it out, um, I'd recommend a, a Wikipedia visit about it. But the reason why I've included it is not from a leadership perspective, but more in terms of what it takes to innovate. Um, since we won the award last year, I've been bombarded with emails and uh, voicemail messages and or telephone conversations with people in our organization complaining to me that it's you know, it's hard to innovate, and I thought we were the world's most innovative bank. So why is it so hard to innovate in our bank? Well, innovation is hard, um, and it takes a lot of persistence, um, and it takes a lot of navigation through red tape, and it takes a lot of dealing with people trained in the art of saying, no, that's not how we do things around here, even at an innovative organization. So it really isn't for sissies, but just like 5,000 people responded to, to, to this advertisement, We've got literally thousands of people showing up in our organization and innovating over and above their day jobs, which is quite remarkable. I'm sure for those of you who live in Joburg, you'd agree that one thing we have in common is we're all time poor and we have set priorities. At FNB, innovation is um, something that happens literally after hours. So I think it's important to keep managing people's expectations around it. And just as I was talking about the Comrades Marathon, and the Argus, I think the Argus, they had 35,000 entries this year. I mean, these are people who are waking up early on weekends, sacrificing time with, uh, with family to train. You've got to ask why they're doing it. And I really think they're doing it to, uh, they've set themselves a personal challenge. They've got a, um, a little voice in their head that's whispering to them constantly. They're trying to shut it up by just going and, and seeing if they can complete uh, the race and or do well in it. Not everyone finishes, by the way, but it doesn't stop them trying again the next year. So it's a very interesting animal that we're talking about from an innovation perspective. Okay, some of the key ingredients. Leadership. Um, for those of you who don't know, we've got a CEO called Michael Yodan, um, and he's just an exceptional human being. He has an X factor that's very hard to put your finger on. I personally have seen him spend about 15 minutes with a team that was working on a particular innovation. And that 15 minutes carried that team for about 18 months. Late nights, weekends, um, sacrificing leave. Um, so he just has a magic about him, which makes my job very, very, very easy. Um, so I always say, if, if, he if he was Justin Bieber, I'd be a 14-year-old girl, and I would throw my bra at him every time <laughs> he walked past me. Um, and, and what Graham was saying about leadership alignment, I think, is very, very key. So Michael became CEO in 2004, um, age 38. Don't you just all feel like overachievers now? <laughs> and uh, he had a, an Exco meeting um, in Mozambique, a Bos Barat. Uh, was his first meeting as, ex as, as CEO. And he, um, the first item he tabled was that he wanted to take the, the effectively the innovation competition. Um, that was running in our corporate division, and he wanted to roll it out FNB-wide. And he slammed his fist on the table, and he said, guys, I'm really serious about this, so serious that I'm, I'm willing to give 20,000 Rand away to the winners. And there were some smirks from, from his ex-co, uh, who, who said to him, well, if you're really serious, why don't you make it a million Rand? And he said, can I do that? And he said, yes, you're CEO, you can do what you like. So last year, he gave away 15 million Rand. Um, in the competition. So the prize money has grown significantly. But effectively, Michael has an innovation target in his scorecard, um, and that cascades down to his direct reports, his Exco scorecards. And, um, and so there's huge alignment around uh, driving innovation in the business. Um, by the way, from a metrics perspective, we pursue 
number of innovations implemented, and our definition of innovation is an idea aligned to strategy that's well implemented, 100% implemented, and has resulted in business benefit. Some people in the organization feel we're just chasing another number, but I think the philosophy, given that we come from a mining town, is 10 tons of rubble, one ounce of gold. If you take care of the quality, uh, the quantity, the quality will, will take care of itself. So a very, very key ingredient, leadership. Strategy, I think the reason why we were invited to speak today was because we have a customer centricity strategy. Our strategy uh, from a branding position is how can we help you, but from a business perspective, it's all about building rewarding relationships. This is very, very key. We innovate with our customer in mind. We don't sit in a dark room and come up with cool stuff um, and then go and test it with our customer afterwards. It, we, we tend to drive innovations that will deepen our relationship with our customer, lengthen our relationship with customer, and allow us to extract more value from that relationship, while at the same time um, uh, giving the customer back uh, some of those in, in the form of some of that benefit in the form of reward. So our strategy per se is not innovation. Structure. Yeah, when uh, r and took over FNB in 1998, I wasn't there, but um, effectively FNB was a grudge purchase. r and wanted to buy a company called Southern Life. Um, it was owned by Anglo-American. Anglo-American had decided they better focus on their core business, which is pulling stuff out the ground. So they put their financial services businesses up for sale. One was FNB, one was Southern Life. r and made an offer for Southern Life, and it was accepted on one condition that they took FNB as well. So we had these very successful um, merchant bankers acquire us, um, and they, legend has it took all the great artwork out of the sixth executive floor. It was their first act as conquerors. And the second thing they did was they said, you're not going to look like your traditional competitors, these big battleships of businesses, these centralized businesses. We're going to smash you into a, a, a fleet of speedboats. And each speedboat will represent a customer segment, and you're going to go out and you're going to trace something called return on equity, which is our profitability measure. So don't cheese the union off and don't break the law. Um, but, but if you hit your profit targets, we'll reward you in, in ways un, sort of familiar to you in the retail banking space um, because we're merchant bankers. And this decentralized structure has, has helped us to evolve decision-making rights in the business to quite low levels. People are empowered to make decisions and get on with stuff. Um, which fits in beautifully with our culture. So colloquially, we call our culture an owner-manager culture. And effectively, leadership at various parts of the business are, in, are encouraged to run the business as if it were their own. Um, so if you ask me what the definition of innovation is, I would say it's, um, it's quite pompous, but bear with me. I would say it's intuition acted upon. It's somebody who's got a gut feeling that something's worth doing, and they go and do something about it. And if you ask me what the definition of entrepreneurship is, I would say it's exactly the same. It's intuition acted upon. And, um, and so there's an inextricable link between innovation and entrepreneurialism. And our culture is inherently entrepreneurial. So that also creates massive tailwinds from an innovation perspective. Processes um, are very unpopular with academics who play in the innovation space because uh, we're not big fans of heavy innovation processes. We try and keep um, uh, processes associated with innovation very, very light. Um, and in fact, it's almost a self-managed process. So Graham was talking about the fact that he doesn't have any budget. Most of you might not believe that in the vast majority of cases at FNB, there isn't an innovation budget. We, we operate a venture capital model. So you've got to go to somebody with budget who has already assigned it to something else that's a priority in their world. And you've got to convince them to invest some of that budget in your idea. And then you've got to go and get people with the relevant skills to join your implementation team and get it implemented. So those skills of persuasion um, and network building are very, very important. And again, those skills are synonymous with being entrepreneurial. People, I've used the word entrepreneurial a lot now, um, but we like entrepreneurial people. Uh, a lot of people who work for FNB run businesses outside of FNB. That's encouraged, as long as there's no conflict of interest. Um, and we look at uh, hiring people who have entrepreneurial backgrounds, even if they come from failed businesses, because the school fees that they've learned through those failures are, 
are, are, are wonderful things to be able to leverage uh, once they work for us. So, and typically we find it's our top performers that are our innovators in our business. So uh, it would be great if I could say that all 28,000 of us were innovating, but the reality is it's closer to about 10,000. Um, and not a bad thing because we innovate within our operating business, which some might say causes a, a, a risk management challenge. But the, the, you, you sort of your Mark Boucher, for those who follow cricket, kind of performers who, who, who just take a lot of catches and are nice and dependable, you know, the three, three out of five kind of performers who arrive at 8 and leave at 4.30 and take their lunch break, they're fantastic. They might not be innovating, um, but they, they keep the business ticking over. And very key is that we have tried to bring some balance into the types of innovations we pursue. The stuff that you'll see in the press and on videos like I showed earlier are, tend to be our radical innovations. Um, but the, the trick with radical innovations is that they're copied by competitors. And our competitors are getting better at copying and pasting and quicker at copying and pasting. So we don't just encourage radical innovations, which by, by the way are less than 5% of our innovations overall. We encourage things called minivations, which is incremental continuous improvement style innovations, which is doing, doing the stuff you've always done, but doing it a bit better. Um, and that is a wonderful sustainable source of competitive advantage because it's like compound interest. It just builds quietly in the background. Our competitors can't see it. Um, and uh, we, we really believe that that's a key part of our success. And the last one is reward, which is the program I was talking about, or the competition I was talking about. Um, we have had about 70,000 ideas logged on our idea management system since 2004. We've had 5,585 implemented. So again, you can see a massive drop-off rate between ideas generated and implementation. Um, and so we try and celebrate the people that are good at getting stuff implemented and, and, and stuff that can move a needle in our business for the better. Um, yes, there's a lot of failure, and you would ask about the business case. So let me tell you about the business case. We gave away about 15 million rand in awards um, last year in the competition, and the year before it was about 13 million. But the combined net present value contributions of our top 48 finalists last year, over a three-year period, will be about 5.4 billion. That's a very conservative number, hugely conservative number. I'm involved in the judging process. And um, I can safely say that it's a massively conservative number. If you cut, divide that in half and divide it in half again, it'll account for half of our profits in 2015. So the business case is a no-brainer. By the way, the um, the net present value equivalent for the 2011 competition is 1.65 billion. So we saw a massive spike in value generated from innovations. It really was a, a golden year for us last year. Okay, and uh, this is my last slide. Um, this is just some food for thought for those of you who uh, are interested in driving innovations in your organizations. Um, it's inspired by the board game Cluedo, uh, where you have to effectively figure out who committed a murder, who done it. So who killed innovation in this case? Um, this is based on my experience of having <laughs> sat in an organization and dealt with people who um, are, are, uh, are good at coming up with excuses as to why they can't innovate. And some of the typical usual suspects are Mr. Distraction Junkie. This is the person who says that they've got no time to innovate. And uh, if if you sit with them over a cup of coffee and you just let them talk, you'll find that they're currently watching the sixth series of The Big Bang Theory. Um, uh, and their life is full of those sorts of distractions. Their life is full of chunks of time that effectively over a three or six month period they could have reallocated um, to pursuing an innovation. So um, I encourage them just to do a quick, honest uh, time mapping exercise. Colonel blocked by bullies. This is the person who doesn't want to rock the boat, scared of their line managers. Line managers, as we all know, and I'm sure there are a lot of line managers here today, are in charge of operationalizing something, making sure the engine runs nice and smoothly. They don't like people who rock the boat. Um, and, the, and these are the meek souls who say, I, I, you know, I, I'm being bullied into not innovating. Um, and the response to that is, effectively, you have to break 
eggs to make this omelet. And uh, there's a guy called Guy Kiwasaki, uh, or is it Kawasaki, um, who you may know. He was the brand evangelist for Apple in the 80s, and he also um, worked at Yahoo for a while. Um, he talks about polarizing people. And he says, if you're not polarizing people, you're not doing enough of the right stuff. You don't want to polarize everyone, um, but it's important to polarize people. And in the innovation space, I think um, you can't get away without stepping on some toes. So you've just got to grow a backbone. Um, this is all or nothing. This is the person who says, I'm not going to innovate until it becomes my full-time job. So I don't do anything by half measures. I'm either in or I'm out. Um, and as I've said, the vast majority of people at FNB, uh, if we were all waiting for innovation to be our full-time job, uh, nothing would have happened to date. Uh, professor suffocated by seriousness. This is the animal that brings a lot of academia into the space and um, ties people up in knots, um, uses big acronyms and wants to introduce prioritization frameworks and all sorts of things. Um, and innovation doesn't have to be this very serious journey. Um, it, uh, uh, um, although I was accused of being the karaoke leader in the, in the business, it, I wouldn't say it's necessarily always a tremendous amount of fun, but I've yet to meet a team of innovators who've regretted taking the journey that they've been on. Reverend clinging to cliches. Um, so how many times can we say the word cocaine at a conference? Yeah. So I'm going to say, um, this is the kind of person who says, I don't fit the profile of an innovative person. So I don't uh, wear the Steve Jobs turtleneck. I don't carry the iPhone. I, um, I, d I don't do co cocaine. Uh, I don't have a broken relationship. I don't wear a beret. I don't live in Melville, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is the biggest load of nonsense ever. Uh, what I've started doing, inspired by a photographer from Ireland, who um, uh, I might digress for a second, but basically photographs, has been photographing people on their wedding day and then photographing them on their 50th wedding anniversary. Um, I've started photographing each of our finalists in our competition over the last three years, and I can absolutely guarantee you that they look just like the vast majority of people in this room, just like you and me. Um, you don't have to be a cliche to innovate. Mr. Just a coincidence. So you would have seen in the video there was a, a part of the script that dealt with a guy who threw a boomerang, and it said, um, effectively, um, what you put out comes back to you. Typically, when you start out on an innovation journey, particularly in the context of FMB, you don't have everything you need. And it's a, it's a mad scramble and a, um, an exercise in persistence to acquire all the resources you need. For those of you who are rationalists or hectic scientists, you can close your ears now. For the rest of you, um, you'll be amazed that as you move towards your innovation, it moves towards you. You will start coming across people at exactly the right time that have something that you need to get your in innovation implemented. Um, and if you start dismissing those as just coincidences, or you're not aware of them and you're not alert for them, um, you're going to battle. You're really going to battle in the innovation space. So I really believe that if you're genuinely committed to your innovation, um, you will be provided with everything that you need to implement it. So don't whine at me about not having enough resources. Uh, general over the hill, this person says, I'm just too old, I'm just too tired, and I'm just too old. I'm just hanging out for my pension. I'm not saying that people like that in banking, but um, uh, again, in my experience, and, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I organize the race, but I also participate in the race. Um, the most successful innovation that I've ever been a part of, um, we had two very wily old dogs on the team. And uh, we thanked our lucky stars for having them. You can never be too old. And uh, what you bring to a team is, is actually quite priceless because you've been around the block a couple of times. So I always encourage them to think about good wine and cheese, things that get better with age. Um, and the last one is, Doctor, it's got to be perfect. And this is the person who is basically an egomaniac, who doesn't want to associate their personal brand with the following things. One, not being an expert. Typically in the innovation space, you are um, not only in, from a radical innovation perspective, even incremental. You are trying something for the first time, and it requires that you uh, acknowledge you don't have all the answers, you ask some stupid questions, and so you don't get perceived as an expert while you're on that part of the journey. If your ego can't handle not being seen as an expert all the time, this will be your issue. 
Uh, and the second thing about it's, um, it's got to be perfect is that you have a, a vested interest in the outcome. So your personal brand can't handle the fact that there's no guarantee that an innovation is going to succeed. Um, and so you will say, no, you know, if it's not going to be 100% perfect, I'm not going to bother. We're done for time. Okay, we've got five minutes. So I wanted to end with a video. Um, and in this video, uh, the lone nut, sorry, still, the lone nut is, is potentially Michael Yodan. And the first followers are people like you and me. Okay. Don't tell anyone I, I said that he's the lone nut in the video. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much.